all quiet early today. Yeah. I know. I don't have a light, you know, until I have a light. They train you to look at the back there for that light in the back. So as long as I have a light, you know, then we can get ready. Good morning. Still no green light yet. The awkward last couple minutes. Awkward. If you just stand up here. Hey, there we go. We have our green light. So it's a time for us to get started with another uh, class. We're going to be going over a little bit more of the history and geography of the Bible. And like I said uh, last week, right now we're going to start to go the time between the Testaments. But part of that is building it up is, is we talked a little bit last week about the history of, um, brief history of the uh, people, you know, the, um, the Jews, and now we start to talk a little bit more of Assyria, and then we're going to talk a little bit of Babylon, and then we'll go through the other nations as well, and then we'll get into a lot of different subjects um, um, that'll be very interesting to some people. Um, one of the things before I get started with the prayer is, is love that these classes, you know, last week was the first week with the, the wife and the wife and the sister, you know, I've taught up here before, but they've always taught at the same time. We've always taught classes at the same time. So either I'm in here and then they're back there or I'm in the high school class and they're back there. So I have the added pressure again of my wife um, being there. But, but then what I have here is the last one I did this a year ago. And I know this is my selfishness here is like, I am so thankful that, you know, Bill Langley is doing much better and that he's here today. One of the reasons I love it is because he sits down here, same spot, and he always smiles. So he always makes me feel, you know, like you're instantly um, at ease because you have that smiling thing. So, um, so I'm glad you're, health, you're back with your health here, but you're also helping me quite a bit because you're up here and I have someone who can keep me calm and not speed. So I'm going to try to go a little slower today. Um, I was talking to Don, but no matter what, I prepared plenty of slides, so I've got all the way through, but I'm hoping to go a little slower so that way <clears throat> if you have any questions along the way, um, try to knock me down. Before, but before we get started, we'll start with a word of prayer, okay? Now, my Father, this time we come to you giving you thanks for this day, Lord, and the many blessings that we have through you. We're about to study um, a little bit more about, that, about your people and then the, the surrounding nations during the time that your people occupied Israel and Judah, Lord. Uh, help those that are here to clear their minds of the other thoughts so they readily be able to prepare and to, to listen to what we're about to study, Lord. Also, again, be with the many other teachers that we have, that they're ready for their classes and that their students are attentive as well. We're also thankful, again, for those that are sick, that have been healed or doing better, Lord. Help, uh, very thankful that Bill Langley is able to come here today as well. Please watch over us each day and forgive us when we stumble, Lord. We pray this in all things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we started, uh, started briefly the Assyrian em uh, Empire last week. For the people that were in the class uh, um, a year ago, I did some stuff on the Assyrian Empire, and then on this outline was a little bit, but it's amazing how many different things you can find on different things. You think, oh, you went through it like three or four weeks on the Assyrian Empire. Well, there's a lot of different stuff, just like on that in the Babylonian Empire. So as we're going to go through there, we're going to go a little bit on the um, outline, and then there's a couple places that I found quite interesting that we're going to talk about as well as we go through. So the early Assyria, so one of the things that um, I, I, I noticed is the same as like in um, for the kings of uh, Israel, there's a lot of the same names multiple times, just like the Herods, or 18 bazillion Herods, once we get to that. There's a lot of these Pilgath uh, uh, Pilsler. Um, he's the very first one, but we get to more of those as we go along. So, but this is the very first one, and he built the Assyrian king, uh, the most extensive uh, empire of the age. Now, again, not the, you know, of his time, it was the biggest empire. Um, obviously, other ones became bigger, but at first, he was the, the biggest empire at that particular time. He was known for his wide-ranging military campaigns. One thing 
learned about, um, we're going to learn about Assyria if you didn't already know, is they love their military campaigns. You know, they, they love war. They love to fight. That's pretty much what they love to do. His enthusiasm for building projects and his interest in the cuneiform tablet collection. So there's just a, uh, uh, one of the tablets that they, that they had found with the cuneiform writing. And what he liked about this particular area, we'll talk in a couple seconds, but under him, Assyria became the leading power of the ancient Near East a position the kingdom largely maintained for the next 500 years. So they were, their area that they had, they really maintained it for a long time before another, another uh, um, empire came and knocked them off their perch there. It says, although the literary texts uh, available from the time, his time, there's evidence to show that during his reign, he inspired the act of recording information, including that of his military campaigns. So he started the cuneiform writing and he really wanted to keep track of those so then that he could be able to do this. What he did, he did it because that way he could have summary text, which served as a vessel like we're talking about, um, much of information as possible with the intent of handing it down to his successors. So one of the things that, um, you know, is like, okay, so when you, when, if you don't have any kind of writing or you have no history of it, how do you know what happened during that time? Just like, you know, if you don't, if you don't know about history, you're bound to repeat it, you know, so you have to have some form of being able to keep track of that. And he used the cuneiform writing in these tablets to be able to tell his successors what he had done and what they had accomplished at that time. Under his successors, um, it declined in power and influence. So, so if there was a time when they were really established and they slowly started to decline down. Um, during this time you know, of decline, it offered you know, the United Kingdom, Israel, under the leadership of David and Solomon, the opportunity to reach its greatest limits because Assyria at this time was under decline. If the Assyrians had been more powerful at the time, they probably would have interfered with the eternal affairs of the Hebrew people even at that early date. Obviously, no, we know that God influenced that as well and kept that particular nation down at that particular time. However, if they had been more powerful, things might have been a little different than what we have in the recorded in the Bible. After the Assyrians had languished in weakness for a period of uh, extended period, uh, Barry told me how to pronounce this, uh, Asher Nazi Pal, is that close? I think it's relatively close. Restored much of the empire's prestige. So he was, when they had that little languishing, then he starts to bring everything back. Uh, he was known for, uh, as a ruthless military conquest and consolidation of the Assyrian Empire. Like I said about the first one, they just love war, 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 but he happened to be extremely ruthless during this time. During his reign, he embarked on a vast expansion program, conquering first the peoples of Asia Minor as far as Neri, which I think Neri was, where was Neri? Um, I forgot where Neri was at, it's someplace in this particular area. And then he extracted a uh, uh, tribute from uh, Thyatira. I'm bad with pronunciations. But that's how much he did it when he first started as well. Uh, then invading Aram, which is modern Syria, and he conquering the Armenians and the Neo-Hittites uh, between Kabar and the Euphrates River. So now he's all the way down to this particular area as well as he's starting to grow in the, the empire that he had at this particular time. So one of the things with him is he was very harsh. So sometimes people would revolt, right? If you have harsh, you have revolts. Sometimes you have a revolution. His, harsh, uh, his harshness prompted again this revolt, which um, he crushed decisively in a pitched two-day battle according to his monument um, inscription recalling this massacre. So just think about it. So you massacre people. Nowadays, if someone does something like that, they try to sweep it under the rug, and they don't want people to know what you did that was bad. You know, they, you know, you, they say, okay, we did this, but we don't want you to know the bad things. Well, he truly did not care what you knew about what was going on. So this is what he put on a monument. This is his words. They're young men and old, old I took prisoner. Some of, the, uh, uh, of some I cut off their feet and their hands, and others I cut off their ears and noses and lips. Of the young men's ears I made a heap, and of the old men's heads I made a, 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 a marionette, which is a tower. So he wanted to really brag about what he had done. I exposed their heads as a trophy in front of their, uh, their city. The male children and the female children I burned in flames. And then the city I destroyed and consumed with fire. 
So not a nice guy, you know, whatsoever. And again, it's just the start of a lot of not, not nice guys with the Assyrian Empire. But again, he wanted to brag about it and just sh showcase, you know, his, you know, his brutality as he was going along here. So the, uh, the rise to power in this particular era, he is probably most famous for his grand palace at Kelu, which is also uh, known as uh, Kela in, uh, in Nimrod in modern day Iraq. So that was one of the things that he's really known for, other than, you know, uh, his killing people and that type of thing. Um, in, in this particular complex, they had these wall reliefs depicting his military success and many victims, so, uh, which were on display at museums around the world. So this is, you know, one of the huge reliefs, and Barry had talked about the reliefs um, before at one time. And then here's a, another one. Um, that you know, his military successes and different things, which is in the British Museum. And I mentioned to, to Barry and some of the people that we were um, in the uh, um, foyer earlier was, uh, three years ago we were lucky enough to go to, to England and then to France, but we went to the British Museum. We walked down this hallway, but I didn't, re I didn't really, I've never done any research in Assyria, so it really didn't have any context to me. But now, with the contest, just seeing you know, all these different things and the, the amount of uh, um, things that this particular person did and how much he wanted to keep track of everything was, it was incredible for during that time. And we're gonna get a little bit more into that. So what is a, re what is a relief? You know, so I didn't know what a relief was. You know, it's like, relief is at, at, at 9.45 when the class is over, that's a relief. But, but what is a relief by this standard, you know? So all the Assyrian reliefs hang flat against the walls like paintings. They are still three-dimensional objects. A carved relief is a kind of sculpture that protrudes, sticks out from the surface from behind. Okay, that's probably a little bit what it is. There are three basic types of relief. You know, you have a low relief, the carving raised slightly um, from the background, not at the best picture, but uh, shocker that it's the Assyrians with a dying lion, lion because that's another part of the story in a minute about how the Assyrians particularly like that. Then there's a high relief where parts of the structure are carved deeply and may be true enough to be freestanding. So you might have a big enough one you're freestanding. This one, I cut it off here, but is at the Louvre right now um, um, in uh, France. Third one is a sunken relief. Um, this image is carved out of the material surface often found in ancient Egyptian art. So they really like that type of relief. So you have the different types. So, um, so what is a relief, or how is it, how is it thought? Because you have all these reliefs, so how is it made? The Assyrians used a form of gypsum for their reliefs and carved it using iron and copper tools. So does anybody know what gypsum's used in nowadays? One of the things it's used in. There you go, Don, drywall. That's one of the major things that you'll see gypsum in is drywall. It's also a thickener or a, a bonding agent for cement as well, you know, so that's um, one of the things, but right here, all this drywall, there's gypsum in it. So the Assyrians use that um, as their, as, you know, a part of what they did to be able to um, do this and then be able to carve out from the gypsum as well. Stone is, um, the stone is easily eroded when it's exposed with wind and rain, so it's used outside. The reliefs are presumed to have been protected by varnish or paint. Now this is what it looks like, and this is just an artist's rendering of what it might have looked like when it had paint you know, on it or varnish on it to keep it um, more secure you know, for the elements. And it's also, it was possible as a form of decoration, this possible form of decoration was adopted by Assyrian kings that followed their campaigns against the West where stone, re stone reliefs were used by the Neo-Hittite cities like Karmesh. So this one is for, like I said, the Neo-Hittites, but it was in stone, so they probably maybe got the, it's assumed they got the idea from them and said, oh, right, let's do this, but let's use something maybe a little bit um, easier to manipulate um, as well, and that's why they went with gypsum. The Assyrian reliefs were part of a wider de uh, decorative scheme, which also included wall paintings and glazed bricks. So it was just not just one thing. But they really went to town when it comes to this. Um, these were first, um, used extensively by um, the king, I'm not gonna try to pronounce again since I did not do it well the first time, you know, in Nimrod. He had upwards to 400 reliefs, you know, 400 reliefs just in, just in his palace. Um, one place said three, 200, another said play 400, so that's why I put upwards to 400 just in his palace. 
And I was telling Barry this morning, it's like he was ahead of his time. So he is, you know, his is the old fashioned, you know, iPhone. When you look at iPhone, how many pictures do you have on your phone? You know, you have a zillion pictures so you can remember different things. So he did all these so he could remember his conquests, his, you know, um, all the different things when he, uh, you know, had hunts, hunting trips, all these different things were on there. So again, he was ahead of his time when it comes to that, wanted to make sure that he could fully uh, appreciate everything that he had done. In addition to the palace itself, he was known for um, throwing one of the most impressive parties um, in history. It was inaugurated his new city of uh, Kalu. He hosted over 69,000 people during this 10-day festival. That's a, that's a pretty you know, long festival to host 69,000 people. His son, uh, Shalemazar III, succeeded him and reigned uh, from about 860 AD to 825. So once he's... Um, but done, then his son moved up uh, on there. Shalman was the first king, uh, Syrian king to come in conflict with the northern, tri uh, northern kingdom of Israel. So this is the first time now that we're seeing that there's some kind of uh, conflict that's popping up as well. In an effort to halt the Assyrian expansion, a group of surrounding nations formed a coalition, which Israel was part of. Um, Arab was king of Israel during that time. The coalition originally, uh, eventually split up, allowing the Assyrians to continue their relentless conquest of the surrounding areas. So this coalition tried to stop them, but then, uh, you know, once they, were, they broke up, they were able to keep expanding at that particular time. Though during um, this period of struggles, um, then after they had some internal struggles, and, you know, so like in any country, like even in our own country right now, we have a bunch of eternal struggles going on, um, is that, you know, Syria had sort of the same thing as well as its war with Syria at this particular time. This allowed Israel to operate without threat from the Assyrian army. So this is where if we look at, um, just look at the size, not necessarily the, the chart, but during those days, Israel had dropped down quite a bit. But now with these challenges from Assyria, um, he was able, uh, during the time of Jeroboam II, uh, he was um, able to raise the Northern Kingdom to a major status amongst the Near East. So with him, he was able now to Bring, uh, catch, uh, get back a lot of the territory that they have given up in previous times because of this internal uh, conflict in Assyria and then their battle with, with the um, uh, Assyrians, the Syrians. So now we get to another uh, Pilgath pleaser. This one's the third on here. Mark the beginning of a renewed period of Assyrian oppression for the nation of Israel. So now as we're starting to get a little bit more history in here. He's also known um, in the Bible as Pul. Um, he set out to regain the territories previously occupied by the Syrians. So all that territory that they had just given up recently, now he's going back to try to get, get that territory back as well. He uh, was resisted by a coalition led by Razin of Damascus and Pekah of Israel. So these two kind of got together to try to go after, you know, to try to um, keep his advances. These rules tries to force Ahaz, uh, king of Judah, to join them. So he's trying to get them to get into this particular fight as well. When, ah when Ahaz refused, they marched on, um, those two kings marched on um, Jerusalem and they were trying to attend to destroy the city. So what does Ahaz do? Ahaz decides, you know, he needs some help. So what does he appeal to? Uh, against the counsel of the prophet Isaiah, Ahaz enlists the aid of basically Assyria to help them because, because they didn't want to go help you know, those two countries attack Assyria. He goes to them to you know, protect them at that particular time. However, um, this protection cost them dearly because from that day forward, Israel was required to pay tribute to Assyria and also was forced to adopt some of the religious practices of the Assyrians and that was in uh, first, uh, Second Kings 2 at that area. Pilgasser was succeeded by his son, Shalemanzer V. Um, and again, a lot of same king names, you just have to make sure you keep the context of when it is. So now we're still um, looking at Israel. When Hosea, Hosea, the, the king of Israel, who had been placed on the throne by Pilgasser, refused to pay the uh, required tribute, Shalemanzer attacked Samaria, uh, the capital of Israel. So when, he, again, not taking you know, the tribute that they were supposed to pay, 
but now they're having to uh, pay the tribute, I mean, the, the attack. After a long siege, Israel fell to Assyria in 722 BC, perhaps to Saragon, uh, Saragon II, and 20, 27,000 ha inhabitants of Israel were deported uh, uh, there was to Assyrian territories. Uh, what happened? This, this, this event marked the end of the Northern Kingdom. Most of the Hebrews deported never returned to their homeland, or at least we don't have a record of it when the Assyrians had done uh, their return as well. So that doesn't mean, so now Israel is off in Assyria, but that doesn't mean that Judah didn't have some, some history as well with the Assyrian Empire. Um, so they still felt it as well. In, and I mentioned this a little bit last week um, as well, but in 701 BC, the king of Assyria planned an attack on Jerusalem. However, the Assyrian army was stricken by a plague administered by the angel of the Lord. And that was in 2 Kings uh, 19, verse 35. Thousands of Syrian soldiers died in one night, and the king was forced to retreat from his, from his invasion. So um, that was thwarted at that particular time, and they were saved via di divine intervention. The religion, so let's talk a little bit about their religion. You know, the religion of the Syrians was much like the Babylonians, um, emphasized uh, the nature of worship. So talk a little bit about it. They believed every object of nature was possessed by a spirit. So they had a lot of, just like, one thing if you notice if you study any of the ancient history, most cultures had multiple gods and a lot of them were very similar and sometimes they shared gods between different, um, different nations as well. So that was a very interesting thing. Their chief god was Asher. Um, he's pretty much um, uh, the, kind of the, he was the, um, the, kind of their creator god from there. Then they had a bunch of different gods. They had Anu, um, which was the god of heavens. They had Bel, which is uh, the god of, um, of the region inhabited by man, beast, and birds. So all these different ones they have out there. Ea, the god of the waters. Uh, we're gonna get to it maybe today, maybe next week. Ea was also this, um, the Babylonian god of waters as well. So they both used that was a uh, god that was the same between the two cultures. And then you had uh, Sin, which is the moon god, which I think that's an interesting name for their god. Uh, Samash was the sun god. And then uh, Ramah was the god of storms. So these are just different ones that they had out that. Then they also had five gods of the planets, which I didn't go into a bunch of detail. So besides having a god of pretty much everything here, then they had the god of the planets, like uh, you know the Romans and the Greeks and a lot of other ones as well had. In addition to the primary gods, they had the lesser gods were also worshipped. In some cases, various cities had their own patron gods. The Egyptians had that quite a bit as well. They had a lot of smaller gods that would just be over a city as well. So then if you go into that region, then you would see a new god that may not be a, a national god, but just a smaller god that's out there. And again, the Assyrians did the same thing. The pagan worship uh, of the Assyrians was sounding. Uh, condemned by several prophets in the Old Testament. Um, in Ezekiel 16, 28, and uh, Hosea uh, 8, 9 were two of the examples, you know, where they were <laughs> condemned at that time. So the nature of the Assyrians, this is what, um, this would be a, a shocker that, you know, I put it up there anyways. What they like to do? They like to hunt, and they like to go to war. That's pretty much what they, they like to do. And like you can see, you know, uh, a lot of their reliefs had, you know, their, um, you know, their war and then their hunting. And they really loved to uh, hunt lions, apparently, because, you know, a lot of the reliefs had lions when they were killing, you know, those. But those were pretty much the two major things that they truly loved to do um, out there. So they were a vicious people when it came to that, because, again, what's their, like, one of my hobbies, I like to watch golf. My kids, you know, make fun of me, but at least that's not a you know, killing people or killing animals, you know, so it's like a, it's a timid, you know, pastime. Archaeologists have discovered the Assyrians were merciless and savage people, like we had already talked about. All the, just, all this stuff just keeps going back, just the heap in history. This one, um, uh, I brought this one up the last time. What do you think they're making them do there? Anybody have an idea? 
So what this is, is the Assyrian, and this is a captive, and this is um, bones of the captured people that they killed. They're making them grind the bones into dust of their, of their uh, own people that they were captured. So not only did they kill you know, the, the people, then they make you grind the bones into dust you know, um, in front of it. And they make a relief about it to make sure that they can keep track of it for the rest of history of how cruel they were on that particular thing. So I think that's you know, fascinating how, how they, um, one of the slides I didn't put up here, but I put up last, um, uh, last year was the, how they flayed people. And I mentioned it last week. Just the fact that they're that cruel that they have no regard whatsoever for a human life, that they would skin somebody alive is just, and in, in, uh, um, if you've ever um, seen like the Predator movies or Prey, you know, that's what he would do is skin people alive. And it's like, that's just gross, you know. Um, the Assyrian army was ruthless and effective, of course. You know, if you have this type of army and, the, and they have this type of thing, people would naturally be scared of them before they even get anywhere. You wouldn't even be out there before. It would just be your, you know, they would basically have already won before they even show up, but based on the reputation that they have. The armies clearly incurred burning cities, uh, burning children, impaling victims on stakes, beheading and chopping off hands. They really uh, enjoyed that, that graphic uh, torture. You know, because of the cruelty of the pagan, of the, and the paganism of the Assyrians, the Hebrew people harbored a deep-seated hostility against this nation. Not a shock that they would have that. One of my favorite one is this attitude is clearly reveal, uh, uh, revealed clearly in the book of Jonah. So we talked, and I talked about it the last time, it's like when God instructed him to preach to Nineveh, the capital, he decided he wants to go this direction instead. And then where is Tarnish? Tarnish is way over here near the you know, rock of Gibraltar. So he didn't get that far, but that's where he was going to go. He's going to go the totally opposite direction, you know, because these people are so evil and doesn't think um, they, they should have repentance, not even just, you know, will they repent? Should they even have repentance? And I think sometimes you may know somebody or we may know somebody at work or wherever that you think is like really evil or bad and then you shouldn't preach to that person because they don't deserve it. So that's not our, our call. You know, you should try to do it to everybody and, and you never know who might turn. Just like, you know, uh, Nineveh, they turn. However, we do know that Jonah was not a happy camper, that they did turn. He was hoping that they wouldn't have turned back to, to the Lord at that point. But that just tells you from the history and the reputation of this country there's no reason why, you know, that Jonah felt like they should be, you know, be spared. But again, when they turned back to the Lord, they got, were given additional time at that point. So that's the Assyrian Empire. Now we're going to go a little bit, start on the Babylonian Empire. So geographically, Babylonia um, um, was a plain in which was bounded on the north by Assyria and Mesopotamia, and on the east by Elam, and separated by mountains of Elam, and on the south by the sea, sea marshes and the country uh, Chaldea, so down in this particular area. So that puts them just in this particular area at that time. So that's Babylonia. I'm going to go there. And if you have any questions, stop me. Okay. Babylonia, uh, name is derived from, from its capital city, obviously, you know, Babylon. People always say Babylon, and it's, that's technically the city, and then Babylonia is the actual country itself. It was also called Shinar, which that was in Gen uh, Genesis 10, 10, uh, 11, 2, and Isaiah 11, 11, you know, called it that. And that's why sometimes people get a little confused because there's a lot of different names for not just, um, you know, biblical might have a name and then another one, but it might be just the same, the same thing. There's a lot of kings as well. Um, as you look, that have multiple names, so sometimes it gets confused because one country says it a you know, calls them a different name than others. It was later um, called the land of the Chaldeans, as we know about as well. Uh, one of the things that always you hear about, it was thought to be the cradle you know, of, of civilization. Watered by the Tigris and Euphrates, it was probable site of Garden of Eden and the Tower of Babel. Again, this is not where it was probably at. It's just, you know, the artist's assumption of where it was at. But this is where, um, you know, this is where the, um, Babylon, you know, does come around both rivers. But again, Tower of Babel, we don't know for sure it was there. They just say it's a probable area of this and probable area of, 
of the Garden of Eden. During the time in which Babylonian Empire flourished, it sustained a dense population. It was, I don't think I put it on the slide, but it, um, it was the first city at that time to have over 200,000 people, which is a lot of people back then, you know, into a, in a smaller uh, particular area. Uh, this area is covered by a, a network of canals, part of it because the rivers being close, they had the canals as well, and they were able to, um, uh, you know, be able to use that to their advantage as well for multiple different reasons, one for protection and obviously to get things as well. Um, it had to be skillfully planned and regulated because this is, again, the artist's conception where you have, you know, the river going right, you know, right through the middle of it as well. Um, one of the things, because of their prosperity, they were able to um, have the soil around the area very fertile, so that would also help with their, um, with their prosperity because they were able to grow crops, do different things in that particular area, a lot of different things that you could do there. It was established by Nimrod, um, and I like how we say that, Nimrod, because Nimrod, nobody thinks of as a good name. Everybody thinks Nimrod, you're like stupid or whatever, but he established it not only after, after the flood back, and that's in Genesis 10, verses 8 through eight through 10 at that particular area. Um, it was located again on the, uh, the Euphrates River within easy reach of the Persian Gulf. So being in that area, it's not really that far down here to the Persian Gulf. So for, for commerce, one of the things we talked about last year was trade. Trade's everything, you know, all these places, they're on, either on a river or they're an ocean or they're on a, an area where they can go, like a, the Fertile Crescent, so it's an easy way to travel. You know, you don't see a big city in the middle of the desert. You just don't because it's not gonna be trade-wise is just not gonna be able to, you know, to sustain itself. Um, only in America do we put, you know, big cities in the middle of the desert, you know, and, you know, use all our water to, to supply it. Um, other places they go naturally where the water's at, not build a city where there's no water. Um, it was an important city um, throughout its history. Uh, many battles were fought for its control, um, which again, we're doing a brief history, we could go really down into it. Um, it was destroyed and uh, rebuilt a number of times as well. Okay, so Babylon, again, um, during the time of Nebuchadnezzar, it was the chief city in the world. This was the place that everybody talked about, Babylon. Um, Babylon was pretty much the, 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 the big name. It covered about 200 square miles on both sides, um, the Euphrates, uh, Euphrates River. One of the things I thought was uh, interesting about this was it had broad streets that had been laid out, so they intersected at right angles. So. Um, I find this one fascinating because, anybody know what this is? Does anybody ever have to, um, so right now if you do GPS and everything, you just can put GPS and you put an address in, right? And then you go to where you want to go. Back when I was in Seattle, um, I sold insurance. So I had to, you had to go, if someone had a house, you had to go inspect the house, right? Well, you didn't have GPS back then, so what you have to do? You had to get a Thomas guide, and you open up this Thomas guide, and it had a grid, and you could figure out how to get to where you're going. Um, the only place I ever used um, this grid really was in a city um, called Bellevue, Washington, because Bellevue, Washington was set up in a grid pattern, like if we go back, if I can go back, um, in a grid pattern. The reason why a grid pattern is, if, if everything's in a grid pattern, you don't necessarily even need a map because if it's you know if you just know where the streets are we always had streets and avenues so if i said if someone was on 156th avenue southeast i knew main street go up and i could hang a right and i was there because it was on a grid pattern so by a city being in a grid pattern it made it very easy to get around very easy to be able to uh you know uh, get from like say the palace or the uh, temple or wherever so if it was truly set up that way it was a very convenient way for the people to to use the city and I probably had that exact same one. Um, it had three poison walls which uh, were wide enough to have chariots pass on them. Um, I kept looking for a good picture of the potential of the chariots, you know, uh, or at least an artist rendering, obviously, you know, of that. But if that walls are thick enough to have a chariot, you know, up there, those are pretty thick walls and very, would offer a lot of protection. Um, it, was, it was beautiful, for example, Nebuchadnezzar's hanging gardens, which were built um, for his uh, meeting, a meeting wife came to be one of the seven owners, ancient world. All these, again, are artist renderings, but just the fact that if they had it, it would be extremely uh, neat and a lot of different uh, detail in this that he have because of the resources and obviously the um, land resources, but also the money as well. 
A little later, so now a little later in Babylonian history, came to symbolize in the book of Revelation um, the world and its wickedness. So if we look at that, it says, great, uh, fallen, fallen is Babylon, the great. So it's going to talk now, it's talking about wickedness, not talking about a uh, prosperous city. And it says, a scarlet woman has written on her forehead, forehead Babylon, the great, in Revelation 17, verse 5. So it's, it, even though maybe in their history it had a good reputation, overall its history was not known um, well. Um, it is now in total uh, desolation, thus fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 13, verses uh, um, 17 through 22. There is, if you, you, can look, you can look up and you can see some recreations of some of the area, but typically it's just ruins in that particular there. But they've started um, rebuilding some things just for tourists, uh, you know, tourist things like they have, which we'll talk, we may talk about today or first thing Sunday Monday. Zergarax uh, says a rebuilding one that they had in the city. Um, as well, but literally none of this is there. It's just really these ruins that are at that, uh, at that time right now. Since Babylon is regarded as a cradle of human civilization, there is, is obviously um, the most ancient of empires at that time. In, a, uh, in about 2000 BC, Babylon was dominating power of the world. Hammurabi, I, I really bad with that, uh, ruled the, uh, the great empire from the Gulf to the upper Euphrates, so he was way up here that his empire was at that time. There followed a thousand year period of struggle in which saw no dominant power in the area. Babylon um, was, was variously controlled by the Hittites, the Kassites, the Emelites, and the Assyrians during this time. So the city was still there, but it wasn't necessarily a power at that time. They kept getting moved from one, you know, one country to another it would attack or take over at that time. Um, but it was still, the city was there, just wasn't a political or, or a military force at that time. Um, this period was co uh, accumulated by, uh, culminated by 300 years of Assyrian uh, supremacy. Various Babylonian rulers tried to assert their independence without much success. So there was a bunch of people at uh, different times that tried to get you know, the nation to become back where they were before. Because remember, there's two... There's Babylonian, then there's a Neo-Babylonian empire. So and then once Assyrian took over, then it becomes, after that, it becomes the Babylonian empire again. Um, this particular king tried to revolt against Assyria and Babylon uh, twice for brief periods. So this, you know, he, he was able to get brief, you know, again, like a lot of countries you'll see, you know, whether even in our time frame where they can, they get a little bit of freedom and then they come, come back and the other ones take them over again. This particular king, again, he was the first one, uh, Mur Murdoch Balaam, uh, to visit. He visited uh, Hezekiah, king of Judah, probably around 712 BC. So he visited that particular king. Saragon II of Assyria crushed the, um, this rebellion. Did this just, yeah, okay. Um, his son, you know, so they, did a devast they devastated Babylonia back in six, uh, 689 BC at that point. So all these different, there's so many different uh, kings in the, this particular area. Some of them were more effective than others, and some of them really didn't have a lot um, that were spoken about them. This particular, he was the son of uh, Sarnag, I really bad, rebuilt Babylon and took uh, Manasseh of Judah captive uh, to Babylon. And that was in 2 Chronicles 33, verse 11. So the Neo-Babylonian Empire, so now we're moving into the time when it's back to when it's actually going to be taking over Assyria at this point. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, um, what, who was the viceroy of Babylon, rebelled against Assyria in 20, uh, 625 B.C. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he established uh, modern independence, so he was the one that was the first one that really got them where they're not underneath the control of anybody else. Okay. Along uh, with Artaxerxes and the Mede, he conquered and destroyed Nineveh and the capital of Assyria in 6 12 BC. So now he's, he's had some alliances and now he's starting to take over um, Assyria at this point. It was the viceroy of uh, Babylon, rebelled against Assyria again. He defeated the, then he defeated the remnants of the Assyrian army um, at Haran at 610 
BC. So now he's wiping up what's left of them at that particular point. And then the final defeat was in 605, and this is where we see another king, the one that everybody knows. Um, he and his son, Nebuchadnezzar, defeated an alliance of the Egyptians and what was left of the Assyrians at uh, Karmash, forever ending the Assyrian domination. So even though it took a few years, they finally were able to, to defeat the Assyrians at this time at 605 BC. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the, the king that typically most stories we hear about, you know, the, um, about Babylon um, is the one we would talk about. He succeeded his father and was the empire's greatest king. Uh, he, was a, he was a great conqueror and a great builder. He built a, a lot of stuff as well. He captured all the territory that had once been held by the king of Egypt from the brook of Egypt to the Euphrates River. So the brook of Egypt is right here. And he, so this was the whole empire that he had at that particular time. Uh, he invaded Judah in uh, five, uh, 605 BC, again in 597 BC, and for a third time in 586 BC when he destroyed the, the temple, you know, the Jerusalem at that point. So again, he multiple times before it actually that Judah went away. He also besieged uh, Tyre for 13 years as well. Um, we'll talk, I talked about it more last year, we'll talk a little bit more because there's, um, when we get to um, Alexander the Great and the Grecians, because there's, you know, there's two sieges. There's the one siege that Nebuchadnezzar did, and then there's a siege that um, Alexander the Great did. Um, so, but a short, you know, the short synopsis is Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the old city, which was on the mainland, and then Alexander the Great destroyed uh, Tyre that was on the island um, as well. And how he did that, even, I'll do it right now, is he, he, he scraped the old island, I mean, the, all, this, all the ruins and everything in here and made a causeway all the way across so that way he could get into the, uh, into the city as well because he wasn't getting there the, any other way. After, uh, after him, after Nebuchadnezzar was gone, it's pretty much you had ineffective kings um, and the empire was clearly brought into its demise. So really, Nebuchadnezzar was the height of the Babylonian uh, kingdom at that point. So the gods were um, the gods were basically the same as Assyria. So remember, that a lot of times their gods were very similar ones out there. Both nations were very superstitious uh, out there. Um, the difference, the one difference, god that they had, they had um, uh, Marduk, was was their creator. And Ea was their spirit of the water, which was the same as the Assyrian one. Some of the other were the same, but they just changed the names up a little bit as well. Um, they viewed the gods, they viewed them as a threat. They felt their gods were not looking out for their best interests. They thought their gods always wanted to harm them. You know, how was they, you know, so they weren't malevolent. The only one they thought was a malevolent god was Ea, because the water, it brought, that brought life, that brought prosperity to their country. So that's the only one they thought that actually was a good god. All the other ones thought they were trying to either kill them or, or you, know, you, know, you know, not help them in their lives. Of the Eva gods, they said, um, door cannot shut them out nor bolt uh, prevent them from entering. They glide like serpents beneath the door and creep through the joints of hinges like a puff of wind. And that's, you know, Dorothy Mills in the book of the ancient world. So this is the, you know, the, the thoughts of how they had, you know, with their, their gods. So if you have these gods and you think they're, you're worshiping gods that you think have your, your, they're trying to hurt you, it seems like a, why would you do that? Why would you worship these type of gods? They believed in witches and demons um, and they put hideous images on the right or left of their doors to scare them away. So... Uh, that's kind of interesting, you know, so they thought, hey, let's put stuff on the doors. We'll keep these demons from coming in, you know, as well. So I thought that was an interesting, very superstitious at that point where you're thinking that something on the door is going to, um, an image is going to take care of that. They believed in the power of the stars. Astrology had its birth in ancient um, Babylon. They thought they could uh, tell the future from the stars. So I thought that was an interesting as well, that some of these different things started in Babylon as well. 
Um, they built temples called ziggurats um, to their gods. So this is one of the things that um, when we talked uh, last year, we talked a little bit on Tower of Babel. Some people think the Tower of Babel might have been a, a, a ziggurat, you know, because of the way it was built and the type of formation that it had at that point. They inherited the idea from, uh, from them from the ancient Sumerians, which again, the ones that they thought might have done the um, Tower of Babel. Uh, the tower consisted of a number of stages, with each one getting a little, you know, a little bit smaller than the one below. They built um, ziggurats of their gods. Their most famous one was in the city of Babylon. I don't know how much. Let's go another minute. Maybe one more slide. They built these temples called ziggurats of their gods. They had seven stages, um, and what they would do is so you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the stages on the inside, you know, would be different colors um, on that. And those particular, each stage was dedicated to a heavenly body, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, the sun, Venus, Mercury, and the moon. So even that had a, had a reason for it. It wasn't just, oh, we want seven, seven stages or seven floors. They're gonna, each floor had a meaning to it at that particular time. Um, many of the festivals were staged. Um, so when they had constant services at the temples at that time. I'm gonna stop right here because I have um, a few slides when it comes to what this, um, this festival that they have that's a two-week festival for the new year, it's very interesting what the king does in order to appease the gods at that time to make their country more prosperous. So thank you for your attention.